New York Times Paywalla Harvard Case Study. Today's video is going to be a deep dive into a Harvard case study that made waves in the newspaper industry, the New York Times Paywall. Picture this, it's March 28, 2011, and the New York Times throws up a digital barricade, turning its website into a restricted zone where juicy content is no longer free-flowing. If you wanted more than 20 articles a month, well, you had to cough up some cash for a digital or print subscription. Why did they do this? Well, the newspaper business was feeling the heat. The digital shift had been a bumpy ride, with online ad revenues not quite making up for the print money that was slowly slipping away. Enter the paywall, a bold move to see if people were willing to open their wallets for online news. Now, the whole industry was watching like hawks, wondering if this was the future or just a desperate attempt to cling to the past. Would paywalls actually work for newspapers? But the Times wasn't just flipping a switch. They had some tough decisions to make. Would readers stick around with a paywall in place? Would advertisers still want in when there's a barrier between them and the audience? And, oh, the dilemma. Should they keep creating the same content for both print and digital? Or was it time to shake things up? In our video, we'll unravel the complexities of the Times digital strategy. Should the paywall be like Fort Knox, making sure no one gets in without paying, or a bit leaky, letting some users slip through? These decisions were the building blocks for what could either be a game-changing success or a digital disaster. So grab your favorite drink, settle in, and let's journey through the choices, challenges, and consequences of the New York Times paywall. And hey, before you go, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell. You wouldn't want to miss out on the exciting content I've got lined up for you in the future. Birth of Paywall Now rewind a bit to March 17, 2011, when the paywall made its debut in the Great White North Canada, acting as a trial ground to iron out any kinks before the global rollout. This was a bold move for the Times. The newspaper industry, grappling with profitability in the online realm, eagerly awaited the public's response to this audacious experiment at the forefront of U.S. news. Martin Niesenholz, the senior VP of digital operations at the Times, wore optimism like a badge, believing that users would happily open their wallets to support quality journalism. However, not everyone was clinking glasses to this digital paywall fiesta. Critics, both in the blogosphere and traditional media, were throwing shade. Fast forward to December 2011, and The Times was singing a different tune. Digital subscribers had ballooned to 390,000, and Arthur Sulzberger Jr., the company's chairman, declared the paywall a success, a roaring river of new revenue. But, and there's always a but, the road ahead was uncertain. Subscriber growth was tapping the brakes, and the allure of a 99-cent, four-week subscription introductory offer had its gravitational pull. The burning question, was the paywall a visionary move for the times in the long run? Would it stand as a sturdy foundation for a sustainable business model in a landscape of ever-evolving technology and media? The digital plot thickens, my friends. Times experiments before paywall. In 1996, the New York Times took its first digital steps and decided to charge overseas users a cool 35s per month for the privilege of accessing its website. A bold move, right? Fast forward two years and poof, the experiment vanishes into thin air. Why? Well, the Times had set its sights on increasing that ad revenue, believing that the future lay in a global franchise built on an advertiser-supported, no-fee registration model. Now let's talk about round two, Times Select. This venture, launched in September 2005, aimed to reel in readers by offering access to star columnists like Thomas Friedman, Nicholas Kristof, and Paul Krugman for an annual fee of 49 beer 95. The catch, while the columnists were behind the paywall, news and other content on the Times website remained free. They even threw in discounts for college students and select readers, plus complimentary access for all the print subscribers in the house. Within two years, Times Select was strutting with 227,000 paid subscribers. But the winds of change were blowing. Social media and top-notch blogs started stealing the spotlight leaving users to question if the premium content behind the paywall was worth the price of admission. 
With criticism swirling like a digital storm, Time Select threw in the towel on September 19, 2007. In a nutshell, the online landscape had shifted and readers were finding their news fix through search engines, social networks, blogs, and other online avenues. The verdict, unfettered access was the way forward, fostering the long-term vitality of the Times journalism. Designing the paywall, now let's take a deep dive into the Times Grand Design for their shiny new paywall. The management, armed with insights from their past stint with Times Select and a good dose of industry observation, got down to the nitty-gritty of paywall planning. So they had four big options on the table, each with its own flavor and flair. First up is the all-or-nothing approach, where users had to subscribe to get any content. A bold move pulled off by The Economist and The Times of London. Then there was the exclusive content vibe, where basic news was free, but the juicy stuff like op-eds and analysis was VIP access for subscribers. Ah, the good old Times Select operated on this premise. Now let's talk about the metered system, which was option three. Here, users could feast on a pre-specified number of free articles or pages. But beyond that, it was a subscription game. Lastly, the fourth option was the device-specific offer, where the Times could charge based on how readers consumed the news, be it in print, on the website, or via the iPad. It was a bit futuristic, given the tech evolution, and not many publications had taken that plunge. After rounds of coffee-fueled debates, the Times bigwigs settled on a mix, a device-specific and metered system. Users got a free pass for 20 articles a month, striking a balance between reeling in the die-hard fans willing to pay for quality content and not scaring off the casual visitors who swarmed the site. The homepage and section fronts are always free, but for the iPhone and iPad apps, it was a different game. Top news remained free, but everything else played hide-and-seek behind the paywall. Now, not everyone in the industry was doing a happy dance about this metered system. Moreover, here's the lowdown. If you strolled in from social networks or search engines, you got the VIP treatment. Readers sliding in from Google got a cap of five articles per day on top of the 20 monthly freebies. On the other hand, if you breezed in from the likes of Facebook, Twitter, or other search engines, the sky was the limit. As long as you wrote in on a direct link from those sources, no walls, no limits. Now, some might say this setup had the potential to stir up a bit of confusion among users. I mean, what's free and what's not? But here's the Times game plan. They wanted to rake in some extra cash while also riding the social media wave. Results. In February 2012, a press release shook the scene, revealing a whopping 390,000 paid subscribers for their brand new digital venture, covering both the Times and the International Herald Tribune. Oh, and here's the kicker. Nearly 70% of their loyal print subscribers jumped on the digital train, enjoying free access as part of their print subscription. Now that's what you call a digital revolution in the making. Chairman Salzberger Jr., the man in charge, spilled the beans on the 2011 results, saying, in 2011, we made significant strides in our strategy to transform and rebalance our company. E, the focus is on building up the Times Digital Subscription Army and creating a robust revenue stream from their dedicated readers while keeping that digital ad game strong. But of course, with every leap into the digital unknown, there were concerns. The Times of London had ventured into paywall territory in July 2010. And guess what happened? In just 17 days, their web traffic took a nosedive by a whopping 66%. Yikes, fast forward to Q4 2011, and the New York Times was in the digital advertising rodeo with a 5.3% uptick. But print advertising rode a downward slope, declining by 7.8%. Digital advertising was the shining star accounting for about 28% of the company's total ad revenue in 2011. Conclusion The Times and their grand experiment with the infamous paywall. Some say it's a success story, others say not so much. In the world of media, opinions are like emojis, and everyone's got one. So feeling all pumped up after the Times paywall triumph, they decided to spread the love. In September 2011, the Boston Globe, part of the Times News Media Group, joined the paywall party, covering the New England region.
And guess what? By December 2011, the Globe had snagged a cool 16,000 paid subscribers. Impressive, right? But hold your horses. Not everyone was cheering. John Payton, the CEO of the Journal Register Company, overseeing local newspapers, threw some shade at the whole paywall strategy. According to him, newspapers had less than a decade to shake up their business models or risk going extinct. And in his words, focusing on paywalls was a surefire way to fail. Ouch. Now now the industry was buzzing with questions hotter than a cup of coffee on a Monday morning. Was the paywall magic still working? Would folks who jumped in with the introductory offer stick around for the full-priced ticket? Was the digital gang stealing the show from the print crew? And the big one, could this paywall dance be the savior newspapers needed or just a fleeting strategy in the grand scheme of ever-evolving technology? Newspapers worldwide had their eyes glued to the times hoping this paywall experiment could be the secret sauce to fix their own sinking ships. Thanks for watching.